Uh, welcome to Math Life Balance. Today, our guest is Ina Zaharevich, an assistant professor in Cornell University, working in algebraic topology and K theory. And Ina is also my favorite storyteller, and it's always a joy to meet at conferences. So, welcome, Ina. It's a pleasure to be able to ask you about your experience in math. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Okay, so let's start. Uh, tell us, please, how did you get into mathematics? The, the short answer is I don't know, and the long answer is it's my family's fault. So I'm, uh, everyone in my family is a mathematician, pretty much. Oh, wow. So my, my dad, uh, my aunt, so in terms of professional mathematicians, at the moment, we have my dad, my stepmom, my uncle, and my uh, grandparents on my mother's side. But my mother also started a PhD in math. And my aunt has a PhD in math. And so it's just, it's not really the question of how I got into math. I just don't remember not liking math. Although for a very large chunk of my uh, young life, I didn't want to be a mathematician because as I told one of my dad's mathematician friends when I was seven, there's already too many mathematicians. Everyone is a mathematician. I want to be a computer programmer, which in retrospect is hilarious. But so why didn't you become a programmer? Um, so my dad was uh, always very good at math competitions. Like he just always won them. And I sort of knew that, oh, I should be doing Olympiads. I should be doing math competitions, but I wasn't very good at it. Um, and also, you know, I was, it was, I was in the US. It was a different structure of competitions. And I mostly thought they were boring. Like math counts in middle school, I thought was boring and silly and I wasn't interested. And so I kind of felt like I wasn't quite good enough at that. So I never really worked at it. And um, so, you know, I just sort of went along with like, you know, I'm better at math than the average person. But then if I wasn't, I don't really have an excuse not to be, right? Because like my family was always like, you know, you don't have an excuse not to get A's in math. You have so many people who can help you if you're having trouble and you shouldn't be having trouble anyway. It's just, you have no excuse. So I just always felt like, oh, you know, I'm just not, you know, I'm, I'm good enough at ordinary things, but on the scale of like mathematicians, I'm not very good. Um, and then, uh, you know, I say this, but keep in mind, I was still pay participating in every single mathematician I had, a uh, math competition I had the opportunity to do, and I was two years ahead of my grade in school math. Wow. But um, this, I'm, I'm talking about my internal narrative rather than the external yeah, of course, narrative. Of course. Um, and then uh, the summer after 10th grade, I went to math camp. And on the very last day of camp, they have this thing where they invite people from previous years at this camp to come visit too. And so a few people came and I was talking to, to uh, this guy named Andrew Dudzik, who is also a mathematician now. And I was talking to him and I said, oh, I'm not very good at math competitions. And he said, oh, I totally wasn't either, but there's this book I can give you and it'll make you better. Like, really, like, how did you do on the Amy last year? How did you do on the Osmi last year? And I told him, he's like, oh, that's where I was two years ago. Don't worry about it. Here, just read this book and it'll be fine. And he told me to read Paul Zeitz's Art and Craft of Problem Solving, which is still my favorite math competition book. It's, it's you know, everybody is emotionally attached to whatever it was that got them thinking in a particular way that they enjoyed. So I'm very attached to this book. So whenever I teach people about math competitions, and I still do, like, if you come with me with like a high school student who's like, oh, I want to learn about math competitions, I have a very hard time saying no. No, I won't discuss fun math with you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have a hard, very hard time saying that. So, um, uh, so I, uh, so I'll often say yes, even if I shouldn't. But um, anyway, I love this book. This is the book I always teach from. And, you know, I was reading in the first, the first actual content chapter, one of the reasons I love it so much is it's about heuristics. It's not about any particular mathematical topic. It's just about ways of thinking about math. And this, it, it introduced me to my favorite problem solving technique, which is wishful thinking. I wish all these difficulties weren't there and I could solve this easier problem. And now I can put the difficulties back in one at a time and see if my solution still kind of works. And somehow this, this works better. Anyway, so I love this book. So um, you mean like uh, going from the end of the problem towards its beginning somehow? Yeah. There was a point I was reading this book 
And there was a point where I actually managed to solve one of the problems. And I still remember what the problem was. And this amazing feeling that I actually solved this. I solved a proper Olympiad problem, like an Olympiad problem, like a proper Russian Olympiad problem, not one of these, like how many ways are there to, you know, like computational brute force thing, but I actually had an idea and solved a problem. And it was this amazing feeling. It was a really big deal for me to actually be able to do it because I'd sort of had this mental image of myself of somebody who couldn't. And I wanted to, and this is something actually that I realized way later growing up, I had always wanted to. I just felt like I couldn't. So what helps you to get over that very popular feeling among magicians? Um, it's a really difficult question because for a large chunk of my life, the answer a lot of the time is I don't. Like I, you know, sometimes a miracle occurs and you feel like, yeah, I can do this. And then you can do a bunch of stuff. But a lot of the time it's just putting one foot in front of the other. Okay, I can't solve this problem identify a thing I can do and do that. Just keep moving. Like, even if you only have the willpower to do one thing every day, this is something that in graduate school, I learned, at least for me, worked. And it's been a huge help, which is some days in graduate school, I, I was like, there's no way I will ever be able to think of anything. I will never be able to solve anything. I will never be able to accomplish anything. I can't believe that they're paying me to sit here and be a waste of space and oxygen. Like, you know, this making many PhD students thoughts just pronounced loudly. <laughs> Thank you. It's just, you know, and it's, it's, it's terrible. Graduate school is really, really hard. And a lot of it is for this reason. And the thing that really helped me was just telling myself, okay, I don't have to work for eight hours today. I don't have to work for eight hours any day. I have to do one hour of work a day. That is my quota. And anything beyond my quota is bonus. Now bonuses don't carry over from day to day. So if you get into the zone and you do five hours of work, that's not five days worth of work. That's just that day's quota fulfilled. But my quota is one hour of good work. Not checking email, not staring out the window, but one hour of sitting down and be like, I can focus for an hour. Or if I can't focus for an hour, which Frankly, I've had days like that. I'm sure everyone has had days like that. I will focus for half an hour now, and then I will take a break for as long as I need, and I will focus for half an hour later. And that is what I need to do. And now, now that I'm uh, a professor, I also sometimes have, and I need to do an hour of email. I can do that at some point, and that doesn't count as the math research. But, you know, I, when I was a graduate student and had no responsibility, it was really an hour. And the thing that I really learned about myself is it's okay. As long as you keep moving, as long as you don't stop, you will get somewhere. It might not be where you hoped to end up. It may not be where anybody thought you would end up, but as long as you keep moving, you will produce something. And the other thing that sometimes helps like, um, so disclosure, which will not surprise anybody who's ever seen me try to give an algebraic geometry talk. I can't do algebraic geometry to save my life. And uh, there was a paper that I, uh, I have where I needed to do some uh, elatic homology. And this was absolutely terrifying. And I literally spent a month being terrified of this thing that I needed to sit down and do. And then, and I kept like calling people and emailing people and hoping that somebody will have already done it and I could just cite it somewhere. And after a month of this, I was like, nope, nobody is coming to rescue me. Nobody is going to rescue me from this l homology. The l homology has come for me and I just need to do it. And I managed to do it and it was okay. You survived. I survived. It was fine. It took a long time and a lot of whining inside my head and some whining to my husband, but I did it. Well, you succeeded. <laughs> I'm intrigued by what you said about PhD time being very hard. And so now that you're a professor, can you tell in which perspective it is maybe easier to be a professor than a PhD student because there is a common narrative that the opposite is true? 
it is far, in my opinion, it is far easier to be a professor than a graduate student. Not because the, your workload is lower, because it, it is not. Um, and not because the math you're doing is easier, because it isn't. And also supervising graduate students is hard. I have no idea how people do it. Keep, I keep being worried that, you know, people expect me to know something like these graduate students are looking up to me as though I know something. And, you know, I just have to fake it because they're counting on me. <laughs> um, and, but because when I was a graduate student, I had this constant looming dread in the back of my mind that this thing that I really truly want and that I tr really truly love that I might lose it. And I won't lose it because of somebody else's doing. I'm gonna, it's all on me. If I lose it, it is all my doing. And this is something that is terrifying because you might lose it. It will be your fault, but you don't know how to fix it and you don't know how to prevent it. And it's just sort of sitting there staring at you going, ha, ha, ha. This is such a good formulation, thank you. And it's, and it's terrifying. And honestly, terror takes a lot of energy. As does guilt, by the way, this is why I tend to tell people like figure, this is why, by the way, I, I always advise a low quota for work. Any amount of time you are spending feeling guilty for not working is wasted energy. Like you should never be spending any time feeling guilty for not working. Not because you shouldn't feel guilty if you're not working, but because you should be put it, setting your quotas at a level that you can actually do. If you are spending more than a day feeling guilty for not worrying, you are expecting too much of yourself and you need to lower your standards. Um, like this is really important. And like there's this balance between setting your standards too low and not getting anything done and setting your standards too high and feeling guilty all the time, but you need to find the happy medium. It's really important because all of that energy you are spending feeling guilty, it is wasted. Nobody gets anything good out of it. You don't get anything good out of it. The world doesn't get anything good out of it. It is just poof. You would be better off playing video games for the entire time that you are feeling guilty because at least it would gain you energy instead of losing you energy. Like all of that energy is just, it, it's just a giant black hole and you need to, and it's important to get rid of it. And honestly, as a professor, I never spend any days feeling guilty for existing because I'm teaching classes, I'm advising graduate students, I'm uh, on a couple of committees where I do work for those, I organize seminars, like there's a lot of other things where I don't have any days. I definitely had days in graduate school where I didn't accomplish anything except for take up space and resources. And like those days were really hard because like I felt like I was a leech on everybody and that's not a good feeling. And as a professor, I don't really have those days anymore because at least I taught my class. I met with my graduate students. I talked math with somebody where I could actually help them as opposed to, you know, talking math where I have the questions. And, you know, it's, it's, so I feel like I'm contributing to the world even if I'm not contributing to my own research. And at least that's not a burden on everybody else. Thank you. Uh, so as far as I understand, you feel more useful for the world? Yes. You explained very well how to uh, think yourself about your uh, research time, your pleasure time, and so on. And this is all good when you're alone, perhaps. But then you go to a math conference and you meet a hundred of your colleagues and they all nonstop discuss mathematics and tell you how much they're working nonstop. And uh, how do you feel then? And if it is it also pressure for you and how do you deal with it, if so? So I will tell you, well, this isn't a secret ever since I, I became a professor and I decided that I should be telling people this, um, but I used to keep this secret. So every conference I went to at around day three, I would need to go and hide in my hotel room and cry for about an hour for precisely this reason. 
um, because being at the conference was making me feel so terrible about myself. And actually when I was a graduate student, this was even worse because I was usually sharing a hotel room with somebody. So I'd need to time it so that they weren't there. And I would go into the shower and I would sit there and I would cry. And like, this was very regular. Like at some point I started scheduling it into my perception of how the conference would go. Like at around day two or three, I couldn't like be planning to go out with people because I needed crying time alone in my hotel room. And like, this is honestly, I think this is not healthy. I think this is not like something we should be doing to each other because ever since I got sort of confident enough in my space in the world that I started telling this to people, people have been, I do the same thing. Or like, I always want to do that, but I feel like I can't. Like, I really feel like, I feel like we are doing this to each other and we need to stop. And I think maybe the first step of that is me telling people that I do that. And it doesn't matter if they think worse of me for it. Um, but there was a point as I was writing up my PhD thesis, which by the way, I also could never do with a bunch of hours at a time. The way I wrote my PhD thesis was by writing for half an hour and then playing video games for half an hour and then writing for half an hour and playing video games for half an hour with a timer for both of these because otherwise I just couldn't focus for long enough. But anyway, like there was a point where I looked at it and I was like, you know what, I'm really proud of this. This is good work. And I hadn't yet, like I'd applied for jobs, but I hadn't gotten any job offers. And I was sitting there thinking like, this is good work. If other people think this is not good work, this is on them, not on me. This is good work. I am proud of it. And if this means, this quality of work means I can't get a job, then I'm in the wrong industry and I don't want to be here. Wow. That's like, a very brave thing to say. Well, it was, and it was, it was, if, I don't know, it was just like this, this day I had, it was a very nice day. It was sunny. It was warm. It was like November, but it was warm. I hate November because it's like, there's all of this, like, I'm, I get very cold. I'm not very good with cold. And November has just enough good days to say winter is coming. <laughs> so, but when I, whenever I'm feeling really bad, I try to remember that feeling that like, I have done good work. I do occasionally do good work and that you know at this point in my career it would actually be far scarier not to like if I don't get tenure it'll be far like that's scarier for me in the sense that like I've put a lot of time into being here I like it here that would be scary in terms of just the uncertainty of it all but honestly if this year has taught me anything it's <laughs> that like you, there's no way to do anything about uncertainty <laughs> just do your best so, um, you know, just, you know, I've done good work. And if that amount of good work means that I can't be a mathematician in the sense that people don't want to give me a job, you know, maybe it's okay because I could have worked more, I could have worked harder, but honestly, at a certain point, it starts affecting my mental health. And I would rather be me and happy and healthy then be a miserable me who has done enough work to get tenure. Hopefully the happy me has done enough work to get tenure. But if not, I would prefer to be the happy me working in a different job than a miserable me in this job because I'm not my job. And this is actually a very difficult thing to say because as mathematicians, we really internalize our math. It's really a huge part of my ourselves. And my math is a huge part of me. I really care about, I really love what I do. But at the same time, there's other parts of me also. And those other parts of me are important, like my family and my hobbies and having time to just be me. And I don't know, I really like, I really prioritize those. I think those are really important. Um, I think helped honestly by my grandfather who was always like, in order to be a good mathematician, you need to eat well and you need to sleep well. <laughs> Similarly, you know, math happens in your head. And if your head is not a good place to be, then, uh, you know, then you can't do math there. You know, math only happens in good heads. Well, that's, a, that's not true. But, you know, it's much, at least for me, it's much easier to do math when my head is in a good place than when my head is in a bad place. So I tend to prioritize that.
I guess for most people it's easier. So, so I'm wondering, you said that at conferences we are doing this to each other, this pressure we are creating. Is there anything you could think of how we could improve the situation at conferences so that less people would be perhaps crying and feeling miserable and not included? That's a really hard question because it's a cultural question. And the question, whenever you're trying to, to discuss cultural questions, they're really tied up very tightly together in many ways. Like, you know, when my math is going badly, I feel bad about myself because like, my math is very important to me it's a part of me it's a part of my heart and my soul and it's not like it's something i can excise so when it's going badly i feel bad and when i'm around other people and my math is going well i want to tell them all about it because my math is awesome and um and you know suddenly i'm around people who might understand it and it all comes spilling out in this giant fountain of math 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 and then you know, doesn't happen that often, but when it does, it's, you know, dramatic. But there's a thing that mathematicians do, which is where we put up a front of knowing what people are talking about. That I think in many ways is quite harmful. Why are we so scared to admit that we don't know something? There's so much math out there. There's you know, the more math I know, the more I know what I don't know, which is, I don't know everything. And it's, it's really, we are scared to say this, we are scared to say, I didn't follow that talk at all. I understood the first two minutes, and then I was lost. And actually, I spent most of the time thinking about this calculation that I'm stuck on. Um, which is not something I've ever said to anybody at a conference, but which is definitely something I have thought at a conference many, many times. But there's this big part of the culture that you don't admit weakness, you don't admit uh, confusion or uh, lack of knowledge about things or really anything where people ought to know the answer like where somehow you're in a position where maybe you ought to know the answer, but you don't. And we learn this really early on, like in school even, because in school we're still in this position where some people just get it. Some people don't need to be taught multiplication. You just explain what it is and people get it. Or like, because, you know, the first time I took an abstract algebra class, I thought it was beautiful and amazing and I fell madly in love and everybody around me was struggling. And I was like, what's hard? You just, they just told you the rules, just follow the rules and you'll get the answer. I don't even understand what you're finding difficult. And at the same time, like I know other people were and it really made no sense to me. Um, and this is really like a thing for a very long time for math for, you know, kids and all the way through high school, that some people just get it the same way some people are more graceful than others and some people can draw better than others even before practicing a lot. We all have different kinds of intuition and different kinds of talents and in school math, the math is often easy enough the talent can get you by. And so we learn very early on that the smart people are the ones that get it and the dumb people are the ones that don't. And, you know, if you're going to pick a, a, you know, a platform to stand on smart or dumb, it takes a very mature person to stand on the dumb side. And so we all stand on the smart side while we're still, you know, let's, let's be frank, teenage idiots. And then at some point, most of us get mature enough to move over to the dumb side, but I don't think it's enough and I don't think it's early enough. I think one thing that older people can do is spend more time at conferences talking about things they didn't understand, asking people questions about the basics. Like maybe we should spend more time 
letting people be smart about things that we don't know. Um, but I don't know. That's the only suggestion I have. That's um, it's it's a very complicated thing and telling extremely a whole bunch of extremely insecure people and I group myself in this uh, in this that they need to show their insecurity more in front of their peers who are judging them for it. <laughs> it's not a very easy ask. <laughs> But yeah. Yeah, I usually think of the being a mathematician as being constantly living on a nude beach, which you cannot <laughs> leave because every time you have to find, understand any new mathematics, you have to show that you don't know something. So you show your insecurity, whether you want it or not. There is no <laughs> way to move on otherwise. And you cannot leave that beach like you live there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a, that's a wonderful analogy. Yes. Yeah. So you mentioned a beautiful story from Mike, which every of his talks has. I'm wondering. Uh, so Mike, as your PhD advisor, perhaps taught you lots of math, but I'm curious, what did you learn from him except math? I learned a lot from him. Mike is awesome. Um, but I think. This is sort of all, all together. So, so Mike's big thing is that all of math, all the results in math have a story. Every theorem has a story. And there's this thing that he said to me back when I was an undergraduate that I still remember, which was that, um, you know, when I was an undergraduate, I thought that the proof was the important thing and the theorem was just something somebody made up. But then it took me many years to realize that it was exactly the opposite. The theorem is the important thing. And the proof is just something that somebody made up. <laughs> and I really agree with that. And I also agree with saying that theorems have stories. Theorems have reasons why they are true. The proof is not the reason. The proof is just the demonstration that like the reason is correct. But the, the truth of the theorem is sort of independent of that. And we can see this because sometimes the proof has a mistake, but the theorem doesn't change. If the proof was the important part, as soon as the proof had a mistake, the theorem would be completely invalid. But often you can just fix the proof. And if you're thinking proof first, that makes no sense. But if you're thinking, oh, well, the theorem is true, then, well, of course there's going to be a proof of it because it's true. Mathematics has its own narrative. And I think that finding those narratives is one of my favorite parts and maybe one of the reasons I like category theory so much. And sort of that is really the, um, like that, that's really something that Mike taught me that like the narrative is sort of the truth of it and the proofs are just something people made up um, and also when you find a mistake, that's when all the interesting stuff happens. But sometimes you have an honest mistake, a conceptual picture of the world that is wrong. And that is when you start to learn things. That is when you start to figure out like, oh, something in the world is different than I thought it was. Like there's actually something to learn here. This is no longer turning a crank. This is doing something completely non-obvious. How do I do this? That is when you actually learn things. So when you meet a mistake in your own work, from finding the mistake to feeling happy about all this good stuff, how long does it take you? Oh, at least a year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> about the you know the principle of the matter uh somebody just found a mistake in one of the papers that i'm most proud of and i am completely devastated just as like like at this point i'm still at this you go through all of the stages of grief um and I, at this point i'm still just devastated about it but you know there's something interesting going on there we will figure out what it is and this is totally not me rationalizing but at least 
historically looking back sort of at my own work, at the times where I've found mistakes and they've seemed terrible and I didn't know what to do about it, sometimes they're just complete disasters. I lost eight pages of my thesis two days before my defense because I found a mistake and I discovered it was unfixable and just everything that went from that part was just not true. Oh. And so I lost eight pages of my thesis. Those are unrecoverable because it was just wrong. On the other hand, other mistakes, I've actually learned a lot from this place where I needed to do elatic homology. A, I learned that I could at least fake doing elatic homology and that was pretty great. Um, and I learned a lot about derived functors and how people who aren't homotopy theorists think about derived categories and uh, what kinds of like six functor formalism and a lot of these things. And like, I, I feel like I learned a lot from that. Um, and the paper became stronger for it. Um, and I really, and when, when proofs haven't worked in exactly the way I wanted them to, I also learned a lot about how the math worked. And in retrospect, all of those things were great. They weren't so great while I was going through them. <laughs> but in retrospect, I really feel like I grew in those really terrible times. And hopefully that will also happen this time. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. As I saw from your CV, you do different popularizing uh, math projects, not only research and teaching, right? So mm -hmm. could you tell about your favorite math popularizing projects? So there's a thing, there's a perspective which I sort of internalized from my family, which I think is very, it seems to be very uncommon in academia, um, which is that, you know, the research that we do, we do for us because it's fun and because it's interesting. Like the important things that we do are the te is the teaching. And that can be teaching graduate students, teaching undergraduates, teaching kids. You know, that is, those are the important things that we do. You know, everything else in all likelihood, nobody will ever read any of our papers. It, like, you know, think about how many papers from a hundred years ago you've read. Um, for me, I think it's one. Um, for most people, I think it's zero. Um, it's, uh, and honestly, I read a paper from a hundred years ago, purely so that I could say that I have read a paper from a hundred years ago, because I felt like, you know, I had, I was, I forget where I was anyway. Like, I was like, I have an opportunity to read a paper from a hundred years ago. I should do it. <laughs> um, and, but usually we don't most papers from, from that time nobody ever reads and some people made work that was then built on that are important foundations of what we do but it's you know it's the work of a lot of people not just the work of one person and so somehow in that sense we are we're ephemeral but just like you know we can live on through our families we can live on through our students and it's not just in the research students, you know, one of the people who affected me the most in just in my entire career was my ninth grade math teacher. Um, and who's fantastic. Um, and, you know, those are people who really matter. And maybe you don't know to whom you matter, but somehow I always felt like you are much more likely to do good in the world by teaching than by, you know, writing a category theory paper. Um, even a really good category theory paper. Um, and so I, I just, I've always taken it very seriously. I think teaching is extremely important. And um, I like working with kids. Kids want to be in your class, unlike all your calculus students who honestly would much rather be absolutely anywhere. Doesn't matter <laughs> where, as long as they're not there. Um, and, you know, but you get a bunch of third to fifth graders into a room and you tell them about countability and uncountability and they will spend 40 minutes arguing about whether there are more rational numbers or real numbers. Even once you've proved that there are more real numbers than rational numbers, they will get really into it and, you know, they will argue about it. I, I um, when I was a graduate student, I taught at Bob and Ellen Kaplan's Boston Math Circle. 
where the idea is you sort of, you stand there and you lead a discussion and there's the same topic all semester. And I had this group of students, we did accountability and uncountability. And then I came in and we very easily quickly showed that between any two rationals, there's an irrational, between any two irrationals, there's a rational. And I just sort of stood there for a second. And then like 30 seconds in, one of the students said, wait, that makes no sense. And the other said, why? And other, they were like, but because there's more irrationals than rational. So how can we be sitting every other one? Isn't that like the whole bijection thing that you get a bijection by like, you know, you sit like this and you sit like this. And I was like, yes. And then they argued about it for half an hour and it was awesome. And like, you know, the opportunity to do something like that is really rare. Like how often do you get to feel like you inspired people for even a half hour long discussion? I'm not even talking about inspiring them for the rest of their life, but inspired a half hour long passionate discussion about mathematics. You don't get that in calculus classes. Maybe you'll get that over a homework problem in a more advanced class if you're lucky and you will never know about it. <laughs> but when you teach kids, they get excited, they get surprised, they get visibly surprised. They, you know, ask questions, often very good questions. It's sort of all of the best parts of teaching um, and some of the worst. But, you know, I feel like some of the, like, all of the best parts of teaching are right there in front of you. And especially with third to fifth graders, you know, before middle school sets in, like they have enough math to do very mathematically mature things if you break them down into enough steps and enough excitement to get into it. And they haven't yet been ground down by permanent records and college applications. And it's really, it's really exciting and fun and it takes many, many years for people's excitement about math to get back to those levels. Um, wow. And so I really, and I kind of hope that this kind of thing inoculates people at least a little bit against this grind of school math. Can you tell about some of your life hacks at teaching when you prepare it or perform? Uh, what do you try to pay attention to? I think the most important thing is finding something interesting in what you're teaching. I think this is vital. If you think it's boring, the students will think it's boring. If you have no way of getting around something boring that you think is vitally important, you should, you'd need to do. Well, A, you should reconsider how vitally important you think it is. And B, if it's really, really important, consider assigning it as a homework problem, broken down into pieces. Um, and, and honestly, just don't do it. I don't teach things I think are boring, which is not to say that like I only ever teach things that I love. The first class I properly taught was analysis and RN, which anybody who knows you, who knows me will tell you that is my least favorite topic to teach. Um, but there's cool stuff in there and you need to find the cool stuff and teach it as though it's cool. Because if you think it's boring, the students will think it's boring. If you think it's pointless, the students will think it's pointless. It will always leak out. You need to go in thinking that what you are explaining is cool. So as you know, as an example, I did delta epsilon proofs in class in order to demonstrate how they are done. And then I stopped and I never did them again unless the student specifically requested it. The big question that I ask myself is what are people going to get out of it? What do I want people to remember? What do I want people to uh to to get to you know if I, if they somebody was asked three weeks later what did ina talk about i would like them to be able to say something like my goal is usually a one sentence description like i'm not going to expect people to remember much but something it was something to do with scissors congruence I, I think that there's a lot of 
thinking that, oh, the subject needs to be built up in this way and you need to prove all of the details and you need to provide all of the steps in the way that you would be if you were writing up the subject in a coherent manner. And I kind of disagree with that. I think pedagogically lies and omissions can often be more useful. So I will tell people if I'm lying, I will say this, it's far more complicated than this, but here is the idea. Um, I took a, an analysis, an advanced analysis class with Paul Cohen. And he would do this thing like, oh, we're trying to find a solution to this vector field, right? So, you know, we're just going to do this thing where we start here and then we move a little bit and then we move a little bit and then we move a little bit and we're going to get this curve and then we can keep doing this and it'll converge to something, right? And that's pretty much what we're doing. And now I'm just going to start worrying about this. Does this always work? Let's, let's say we're in the best possible scenario. Will it work in that case? And what is the best possible scenario? Let's try to write the proof and figure out the best possible scenario. And now let's think about what can go wrong. And now I'm just going to start worrying about things like initial conditions and such. And uh, I think that's a really great way to teach because it shows you, again, organically what the story of the math is. And that's what people are going to remember. This was a class I took when I was 18. And I still remember him standing at the board, drawing these pictures and talking about worrying about the details. What people remember are stories. What people, people don't actually, okay, I don't want to say it about all people. Most people don't think rigorously. Most people think in terms of vague amorphous connections. And as mathematicians, we learn to make them rigorous. We learn to clarify them and pull apart the details. And it's a, it's a great art that we, are, that we can do this, but we still think in terms of stories. And I think to teach people, it's important to tell these stories. And sometimes they'll disagree with you and tell you that your story is wrong. And that's great. That means they're constructing their own, which is different from yours. And they're going to remember it even better because they disagreed with yours. Um, but, you know, that, that's, that's what the goal is. To Instead of having it just be A, B, C, D in a, in a sort of direct rigorous manner to sort of weave it together into a story. And I will tell you that some people hate this. Like I have had students who have hated this, who are just like, why can't you give a proper proof in class? Just one proof without hand waving a detail or messing up and not fixing it, which I totally do. I will be like, oh, I made a sign error here. But if you fix it, all the rest of it will still work because I know this is true. So you can figure out how to fix it on your own. Oh, well, there are um, books for such students, I guess. Right, and, and it does, and yeah, and I, that's what I tell them. This is, this is what the book is for. This is what the paper is for. All of my papers have all of the rigorous details there and I have all of the computations in there. And if you're reading one of my papers and I skip a step in a calculation and you're annoyed, you should pull up the tech on the archive because it's probably commented out in there. Great. So speaking of stories, is there any text about math experience that you would recommend? There are a few, but maybe you know of such. I have to admit that I have never read this book in its entirety. This is the second edition. Um, for Russian speakers, the second edition was not translated into Russian. Only the first edition was. And the bit that I'm about to read from is only present in the second edition. So I've never read this book in its entirety. I've read several chapters from it and I love it. But especially the description about the good proof versus the bad proof. Um, anyway, I love this book. It's a great book. But there's a bit at the end, page 196, uh, which I read a lot because there's two sections on it. It's about uh, Littlewood is philosophizing about mathematical life. And I read this because uh, because it explains a lot about myself to me and also makes me feel better when I'm feeling down. So I'm just going to read it to you. There's one drawback to a mathematical life. The experimentalist, having spent the day looking for the leak, has had a complete mental rest. A mathematician's normal day contains hours of close concentration, at least if you're a little wood. I've never had hours and hours and hours, but you know, to each their own, and leaves him jaded in the evening. To appreciate something of high aesthetic quality needs close attention, easy to the unfatigued, but a strain for the fatigued mathematician. Music seems a happy exception to this. This is why we tend to relax either on mild nonfiction like biographies 
or to be crude and to the derision of arts people on trash. There is, of course, good trash and bad trash. And I love this. Uh, it very much describes my life in many, many ways. And in particular, one of the ways you can tell how well my research is doing is by asking what I've been reading recently. And if I tell you I've been reading romance novels, that means I've been doing a lot of work. Whereas if I tell you that I decided that I was finally going to reread uh, Thackeray or War and Peace, that means my research is completely stalled. <laughs> um, there's also something that I tend to read to my graduate students when they inevitably come in at the end of finishing a project and explain to me that uh, they've been editing their paper and they just don't see the point of sending it in because it's completely trivial and nobody's going to be interested in it. And in that case, I again point them to page 196, where just a couple of paragraphs down from what I just read, Lillewood says the following. When one has finished a substantial paper, there is commonly a mood in which it seems that there is really nothing in it. Do not worry. Later on, you will be thinking, at least I could do something good then. <laughs> <laughs> this is so true. <laughs> it's very true. Uh, one of the big reasons why I love this book. Um, Bond is also just full of gossip and good math. He he calculates how long a wax mouth would a wax mouse would survive in hell, given like computing the temperature of hell and how long. It, it's fantastic. It's fun. It's extremely snarky. It's filled with seventy year old Cambridge gossip. It's it's great, um, and and I love it. And yeah, in terms of mathematical experience, that is my go to book. Thank you. That's a very good recommendation. I haven't read the book. I, I read Littlewood's essay, which perhaps contains some of these thoughts, but now I'll read the book too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, could you maybe summarize, although you've already mentioned some, uh, or maybe mention some unspoken biggest challenges of our job, in your opinion? There are some jobs that try very hard to become the core of who you are. And math, I think, is one of these things. And in many ways, I mean, it is in many ways also the core of who I am, but it also isn't. There is a me that is separate from math. And I think it's really important to remember that, that especially when your math is going badly, which look at some point, it's definitely 100% going to. Um, it's when things go badly, you need to remember that you are not your math because your math is going badly, you are not bad because you know something is not working out that doesn't mean that you are not worthwhile um it and this is this is a difficult boundary to draw because we internalize so much because we care so much but it's really really important um does having children help you in this yes it does because you know when you are when nobody is counting on you, it's very easy to get swamped by it because there's nothing pulling you back. But when you have children, you know, you can't not do anything else because they need to be fed, for instance, um, on a vaguely a schedule of some form or another. <laughs> um, and but it also helps with not feeling useless when things are going really badly. When like, you know, when you spend three weeks on something and then you find a counter example and you realize that your entire three weeks worth of work was based on something false and like everything's falling apart, you just wasted all this time. Well, but you still accomplish something today because your kids need to be fed and you fed them. Congratulations, like you did something. Um, so that stuff, but I think in terms of challenges, I think that's like not letting the math take you over is really important. Um, that's, yeah, I think that's a very good answer. Uh, okay, the very last question, mm -hmm. which you already answered several times, but maybe you have something more to add to that. Which advice you'd like to give to young mathematicians?
be brave even if you aren't.